Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of even this day gathering together to bless the Lord and to declare his wondrous works and to marvel in his love for us. Lord, we ask your blessing upon each one that is gathered with us and may now our ears be open to hear the voice of your spirit. Speak to us, Lord, from your word. And let, Father, there be that work of your Spirit wrought in our hearts this day as your word finds lodging place, grows and brings forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Fellows, I think it's going to take one more week at Twin Peaks next Saturday and uh, we ought to be able to get the, as, as about as far as we can go. And uh, what you need to pray about is our kitchen, whether or not they'll be able to get all of the uh, stoves and everything else into the kitchen. Uh, it looks like the rest is within the realm of possibility still. Uh, and uh, the kitchen supplier said that he wasn't quite sure. So uh, that's what the real problem is right now. Keep that in prayer. And uh, we're still hoping uh, to be able to open July 1st, but we do need, fellows, one more week of this week just cleaning up things and getting things ready for camp to go. So uh, next Saturday, if you can go up and help us, we would appreciate the help. This week we've been reading Josh, or Judges, actually, chapters 9 through 11. Tonight we'll be studying uh, these chapters. And so we invite you to come out this evening. Join with us as we journey through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 10th chapter of Judges, beginning with verse 6. We read, The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And they served Baalim and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the children of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and served him not. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. And for 18 years, all of the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead, moreover, the children of Ammon uh, passed over Jordan uh, to fight also against Judah, against Benjamin, the house of Ephraim. So Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God, and we have served Baalim. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites, did oppress you, and you cried unto me, and I delivered you out of their hand. But you have forsaken me, and you have served other gods, and wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. There is a time we know not when, a line we know not where, that marks the destiny of men twixt sorrow and despair. There is a line, though by man unseen, once it has been crossed, even God himself in all of his love has sworn that all is lost. God said to Noah, I will not always, my spirit will not always strive with man. There came that time when they cried unto the Lord for deliverance and God said, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Call on the gods that you have chosen. This particular section in Judges begins with that old familiar refrain, the children of Israel did evil again 
in the sight of the Lord. And they began to worship Baalim and Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, Sidon, Moab, and Ammon. And they forsook Jehovah. The declaration they served these other gods could be translated, and they became slaves to Baalim and to Ashtaroth. Baalim and Ashtaroth were the god and goddess of sex. They became slaves to sex. Your life is mastered by some power, by some ideal, by some desire. And if the big thing in your life is, say, partying and drinking, then uh, your life is mastered by Bacchus, uh, the god of partying. Uh, if your life is mastered by your desire for pleasure and that rules over your life, then your God is a Molech, the God of pleasure. If your whole thing is shopping and you've got to have things, and, and there are people that advertise their little gods on their bumper stickers, uh, and uh, if shopping, the possession of things, is the master passion of your life and is the controlling factor of your life, uh, then uh, your God is mammon. You know, there are people that buy things that they don't need. They just have to buy. And they're sort of caught up in, in spending sprees. They, they just can't help themselves. And uh, mammon has become their God. The New Testament writers identified themselves as slaves of Jesus Christ. By that, they were saying that Jesus was their God. He was the master passion of their lives. Their lives were devoted to him, to serving him, and just to become enslaved to his will. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He will hold to the one and despise the other. He'll love the one and hate the other. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. That is the God of possessions. It just can't be. But it is true that you are serving some God. Everyone is serving a God, the God that is ruling over their lives. And if you can discover what is the master passion of your life, that primary drive in your life, then you will have discovered your God. What desire or what is it that is holding sway in your life today? The prophet Jeremiah called to the people of God, and he said that you have committed two evils. One, you have forsaken the fountain of living water, and you have hewn out cisterns. But he said they are broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Israel is an arid place. They do not have an abundance of water. And because it is arid, it was necessary in the older days before they had developed their uh, irrigation systems and bringing water from the Sea of Galilee and all, it, it was that they had to, especially around Jerusalem and down into the wilderness, carve out of the limestone these huge caverns or caves that served as water reservoirs. And uh, many of them were extremely large. Uh, but in the winter time, when they got their winter rains, uh, they would direct the flow of the runoff water into these large caverns, fill them with water, and they became the reservoirs. 
And uh, as soon as, of course, filling it with rainwater, it would be uh, muddy, dirty water many times it went in, but of course the dirt will settle to the bottom and, and thus uh, you're able to uh, water your garden or use water for your household out of these cisterns uh, that they had carved out of the rock. And uh, of course, if you're going to use it for drinking purposes, you'd usually strain it because these little wiggle tails would uh, develop in it. So you'd want to strain it not to get too much protein with your water. Uh, but uh, that, was, that was a necessity uh, for uh, their livelihood. Water is necessary for life. Now, the prophet is likening God to a spring of living water or running water throughout Israel. They have many springs. And from these springs, uh, there comes this crystal clear running water. And uh, it gives life. And, and to live by a spring would be a great benefit. And most of the cities were built by springs. Uh, nearby springs, uh, so that the city would have a supply of water from the springs. But here the prophet is comparing to the water out of a cistern to the water that comes from a spring. And, and he said, you have forsaken the fountain of living water, that is God. And you have carved out systems of belief, philosophies, or you've allowed your life to be mastered by some passion or some desire. But he said, they don't really give you life. They are broken cisterns. They can't hold water. Up near the top of the Mount of Olives, right below the uh, international or the Intercontinental Hotel there. Uh, down just a few steps from the parking lot, uh, there is a gate and the sign says, the Tomb of the Prophets. And so uh, you can go in and pay the fellow a few shekels and he will give you a candle and you can go down into this uh, tomb of the prophets. And in this large cave, you'll see a lot of little niches uh, where people were buried in times past. Now, I'm sure that there was never a prophet buried there, uh, but the fellow's trying to make a prophet out of uh, this cave, and so he calls it the tomb of the prophets and charges you to get in to look at it. But the interesting thing, as you look at this so-called tomb of the prophets, uh, you will see above it, there's this large uh, round hole, and then the little rivulets that have been carved into the rocks uh, to direct the rainwater when it rains uh, from the hillside above it. The water was directed to come into this large cave or cavern that was there. But evidently, after the fellow had spent years and years carving out this great cave to be a cistern, when the rain did finally come, it just went on through. There was a fissure in the rocks and it didn't hold water. And so, uh, and I think very appropriately, uh, they turned it into a tomb. So they buried people there. And I think of how many people are buried in dead systems of belief that can't really hold water. They can't give you life. They, they leave you empty. And, and you come to get water, but you find that in those systems, it, it, there is such an emptiness uh, that uh, it brings to those who trust in it. It's interesting to note that when people get into real trouble, they want to call on the God of the Bible because they realize that the gods that they have been worshiping and serving can't help them 
when there is a real problem of life and death. Here were the children of Israel. They were serving Baalim. They were serving Ashtaroth. They were serving the gods of the Moabites, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of uh, the Sidonians, and they were worshiping all of these other gods until they got into real trouble. And then who do they call on? Those that are worshiping their sexual desires involved in the worship of sexual promiscuity. When they find themselves with AIDS, they can't call upon their God to help them. If a person is mastered by his desires for alcohol, it can't help you when your house is being foreclosed on. One of the richest men in the world offered his doctor several million dollars if he would give him one more year of life. The doctor, of course, was unable to do so. And all of the money that he had could not give to him an extension of one year. When you get into real trouble, you want a God that is not insensate. You want a God that can hear when you call, that can see when you're in need, and that can reach out and help you. As David, and we read it in the psalm this morning, they're gods, he said, the gods of the heathen, recognizing that every man has a God. They're gods they've made themselves. They're the projection of their own desires unto a form of deity. They have become slaves to their passions or to their desires. But speaking of them, he said, though they have eyes, they cannot see. Though they have ears, they cannot hear. Though they have mouths, they cannot speak. And though they have hands, they cannot handle. They are insensate. And to worship an insensate God, when you really get to the place where you're needing help, when you're in real trouble, you want a God that is able to hear, don't you? You want a God that is able to reach out and to help you and to save you. The children of Israel have more or less been playing games. When in need, they'd call on God. When things were going well, then they would soon turn after their other passions and become enslaved by their other passions. And now we come to a time when again, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Again, they became enslaved to their enemies. Again, they called unto God for help. But this time, God said, don't call on me because I won't help you. Call upon the gods that you have chosen. Of course, they didn't want to do that because deep down inside they realized that these gods that they had chosen to worship could not help them in desperate life and death situations. Note, the gods that you have chosen. There's a very important truth here because a man chooses which god he will serve. Joshua stood before the people at the end of his life, and he called upon them to choose the God that they will serve. Whether they worship the gods that the Babylonians worshiped or the Egyptians worshiped or the gods that the people were worshiping in whose land they were now dwelling. But he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This past week, unto every man an answer, I received a 
phone call from a little 11-year-old girl. It touched my heart. She was concerned for her father's salvation. She said, he says that he's a Christian, but he never goes to church with us. And now my younger brother and sister don't want to go to church because daddy doesn't go to church and they want to stay home with him. He never reads the Bible. Whenever we turn on the radio and it's a Christian broadcast, he'll walk out of the room. And though he says he's a Christian, I don't think that he really is a Christian. Can you be a Christian and never serve the Lord? My heart was touched. This little 11-year-old girl concerned with her father's eternal welfare. Whereas the father should have been taking the role of the spiritual leader within the home. Rather than your daughter being concerned about your salvation, he should have been concerned about his daughter's salvation and the rest of his children. For the Lord has called upon fathers to take that role of spiritual leadership within the home and to lead the family in the things of the Spirit. But as we said earlier, whatever God you serve is the God that you have chosen to serve. We choose what will master our lives. You can choose to believe in God or you can choose not to believe in God. You are free to choose your master, what God or passion will rule over your life. If your life is ruled by hate, it's because you've chosen to be ruled by hate. If your life is mastered by passion, it's because you've chosen that your life should be mastered by your passions. If your life is mastered by bitterness, it's because you've chosen to be bitter. If your life is mastered by greed, it's because you've chosen to be greedy. Even as I choose what I will submit my life to be ruled by, that becomes my master. It becomes my master passion. It becomes my God. I also choose what I want to believe. I choose not to believe that a man is damned because he was ordained by God to be damned. I choose to believe that a man is damned because he has not chosen to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. I believe that every man who will choose to surrender his life to Jesus Christ will be saved. I believe that it is man's fault if he is lost, that God cannot be blamed for a man's being lost forever. You say, well, I don't believe the Bible. And I don't believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. That's because you've chosen not to believe the Bible. And you've chosen not to believe in Jesus Christ. I have chosen to believe that the Bible is God's word. I have chosen to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I have chosen to believe that God loved me so much he sent his Son to die for my sins that I might have fellowship with God. I believe the Bible. You say, well, I don't believe it. Well, that's your choice. But you can't blame God. That's your choice. You've made that choice not to believe. 
And of course, you can create your excuses for not believing. I can give you my reasons for believing. But basically, bottom line, the reason why you don't believe, you might have excuses, but the reason is you want to live an evil life. And Jesus demands that we walk in purity and in righteousness and in only, but you've chosen not to. You see, Jesus said, the Father didn't send me into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And if you believe in me, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe in me, if you choose not to, then you are already condemned because you haven't believed on the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. This is the reason. This is behind it. Light has come into the world, but you won't come to the light because you love the darkness rather than the light because your deeds are evil. Bottom line. Now, you offer me all of the excuses you want. Bottom line, you want to live an evil life. And you know that to come to Jesus Christ, you can't do it. And so you've chosen not to believe. God did not only give me the capacity of choice to choose who would be my master, but God is also holding me responsible for the choices I make. He invites me to love him, to serve him, but he doesn't force me to love him or to serve him. He leaves that up to me, my choice. And true meaningful love and service demands the choice. So God speaks of the gods that they had chosen. An important question that you need to ask yourself is, what God rules over my life? What God have I chosen to serve? For sooner or later, there will come a day when you are facing a situation over which you have no control. You'll be needing help desperately, and you'll have to turn to your God for help. You want to make sure that when you cry out to your God, he can hear. When you call out to God, he can help. And when you come to death's door, you want to make sure that the God that you serve and have chosen to serve is able to bring you into his eternal kingdom of light and life. You say, oh, that's what I hate about you preachers. You're always talking about death. Well, tell you what. Make you a deal. When people quit dying, I'll quit talking about it. <laughs> but I'm thankful that I have chosen to serve of God that not only is there to help me through life, but will be there when the day comes that I take my last breath, can take me by the hand and lead me safely to his home, as Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And that day when it comes, time to lead this life, I want a God that can take me safely home, to his home and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of his grace and love for me. And so, how tragic when they were in real trouble and they cried unto the Lord. He said, don't cry unto me. I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Cry unto the gods that you have chosen. Let them deliver you. 
I pray that you will never hear those words from him. That he'll never say to you, cry to the gods that you have chosen, let them deliver you, because I won't deliver you anymore. I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of your calling in the time of great need only to turn your back and walk away again. Go ahead, call upon the gods you've chosen. Let them help you. Tragic words indeed. May you never hear them. Let's pray. Father, how can we thank you enough that you have drawn us to yourself, the true and the living God, given us the power of choosing to love you and to serve you. Lord, we want to serve you faithfully. We want to love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our souls. Lord, there are those here today who have chosen other gods, whose lives are mastered by other forces, who have spent their life digging out cisterns developing philosophies and systems of belief which really can't hold water, which really do not hold up in the time of real need. Help them, Lord, to this day surrender their lives to you. Walk in wisdom serving you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? <clears throat> the pastors are down here at the front to pray for you. And if this day you would like to choose to drink from the fountain of living water, if you'd like to choose to serve the true and the living God, then as soon as we're dismissed, I would encourage you to make your way forward. They're here to pray for you and to help you to discover the one who will never fail you, the one who will be able to help you and will help you in those days of greatest distress and need. How important in choosing a God that we choose one that is able to hear and able to answer and able to help. May the Lord be with you, watch over and keep you in his love as we follow after him. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and, keep thee. and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And now, on behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today. P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589. Or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.